that F2C might uh, be re revised freedom to choose, uh, because in a sense that's very much a part of what this is all about. I have to convince my laptop that I'm me, so if you'll forgive me, uh, I'm going to try to remember the eight uh, mumble foo here. Let's see. Over the weekend, I went through a, um, a major upgrade of my software, and I don't know about you, but uh, <clears throat> every time I upgrade to the new version of the operating system, a bunch of stuff doesn't work anymore. So. Uh, Never happens, right? And this is a Mac, too, on top of everything else. Now, I am, I'm not um, uh, using any PowerPoint slides or anything. And you all know that my uh, motto is power uh, corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. So, so I'm, I'm going to ask you to please listen to me as opposed to reading my slides. Which, so you won't, but I have slides in front of me to remind me what it was I was trying to say. The first observation I would make is that we have it within our grasp to connect every person on the face of the earth to each other and to all human knowledge. We have an opportunity to pursue a policy of plenty versus poverty. In fact, if you read Peter Diamandis' uh, recent book called Abundance, you'll get a flavor for what that might mean. We'd have to be a pretty stupid species not to take advantage of this opportunity, but there are problems. There are technical threats to the internet as it currently exists. And remember, I'm speaking broadly of internet, including all the computers at the edges, the software that they have inside, the things that you and I do on the net. It's a very broad uh, kind of definition of the internet, not just the routers, not just the physical hardware. But uh, those devices that we use are uh, subject to invasion by viruses and worms and Trojan horses. There's phishing and there's farming, there's DNS cache poisoning. There's social engineering, which is being exploited uh, increasingly to cause trouble. Where we used to have spam, for example, there's actually been a diminution in spam and a replacement with what's called spear phishing. Spear phishing, of course, is a way of trying to uh, atta attract attention to a particular target to persuade the target that that piece of email, for example, is something that should be opened up. Uh, if you have been following the story behind uh, the uh, uh, invasion at RSA and the uh, uh, obtaining of some of the crypto variables, uh, you'll realize that that began with a spear phishing attack against someone who was responsible for budgeting. And the email message said, you know, 2012 budget, you sort of think that's the sort of thing you should click on. It apparently came, I don't remember, I didn't, maybe never knew what the details are, who it appeared to come from, but uh, the party uh, clicked it and it had a, a spreadsheet in it that had a flash uh, executable. And the flash executable executed just because the uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet opened up. And then it installed that piece of infected flash uh, code, installed uh, a keylogger or some other uh, uh, Trojan horse. Uh, and then generated a fake spreadsheet. And if you weren't actually watching very closely, you would have, uh, would have missed the fact that the spreadsheet started out empty and then suddenly filled in. Uh, and that led, of course, to further invasion by capturing passwords and other kinds of things. So this stuff is going on, and it's a serious problem uh, for us. There are dictionary attacks against poorly chosen passwords. Uh, and then there's web-based drive-by downloads where you get infected just by looking at a particular website. So those threats, um, among many others, I'm not trying to be complete here. There are also institutional threats, and in some ways these are worse, because technical threats you can sometimes do something about. You can engineer your way around them. But institutional threats are harder because the response is not necessarily technical. The response has to be political. And there are some political frameworks in which it's very hard for people like you and me to respond. So, for example, the ITU is having its uh, World Conference on uh, International Telecommunications in December in Dubai, where it will be revising the now 20-year-old international telecom regulations. It, it appears, uh, even though it's a little hard for us to tell because uh, the proceedings are not open and not public, uh, it's a little hard to tell exactly what's going on, but there's a strong indication that Internet will enter into the picture, that regulations making reference to Internet will show up, 
there might be uh, issues about applying old PSTN models like termination charges or interconnection, you know, compulsory interconnection or other kinds of mechanisms that may have been relevant a hundred years ago when the telecom world was primarily operated by governments, but it isn't very relevant to the 21st century where the private sector is the primary player uh, in these systems. Intellectual property protection or intellectual property rights protection is another theme which is likely to show up uh, in the discussion of these ITRs. Uh, mandatory standards, the possibility that the ITUT voluntary standards might be made mandatory in the, con in the course of revising these ITRs is another scary possibility. Uh, we've all benefited, I think, from the fact that the standards associated with the Internet have been voluntary in nature. In fact, the entire Internet was a very voluntary kind of uh, organism. When Bob Kahn and I were doing this original design, our hope was that people uh, would take the detailed specifications for the Internet, build a piece of it, and then find somebody to connect to. And in fact, I think that's how the Internet has grown over uh, the uh, three decades or so that it's been in operation, uh, is simply by uh, accreting additional implementations of the Internet protocols and then finding people to connect to. Uh, there are also uh, in a, in a growing, uh, there's growing indication that some of the state actors are concerned about cybersecurity and want to use this as a cloak to excuse certain kinds of rules that would allow them not only to uh, perhaps suppress uh, cybersecurity threats, but by the way also suppress political speech and other things. Or organizations or political structures that uh, are in power uh, are often scared by the possibility that the general public over which they hold sway might actually figure out that they don't want the parties in power. They see this, especially the uh, Arab Spring, for example, is a very scary thing. I need to, I need to say to you that pounding your chest uh, and, and pointing out that the Arab Spring is uh, a, an example of the power of the Internet may not be doing uh, us a favor because what it does is instill a great deal of fear in those administrations that see this as chaos. They see this as the potential for ousting them from power. And I have to say that um, these phenomena, which are heavily uh, infused with social networking elements, don't always have the outcome that we wish they did. I think the Egyptian situation is an example where the outcomes are not quite clear. The Tunisian situation where this original Arab Spring started seems to have come out somewhat better. Others varied dramatically, the Libyan situation being yet another, and Syrian situation, a fourth one. So we, ha we should be, I think, thoughtful and cautious about pounding our chests and saying that uh, the use of the Internet for this purpose uh, is somehow um, a good thing. It, it is not necessarily, does not always have the outcome that we wish. We also have uh, some state actors that are actively involved in uh, trying to constrain what we can and can't do on the net. In the European Union, in the United States, the BRIC countries, uh, and uh, in uh, South Africa and others, are using security, data flows, privacy, IPR protection uh, as an excuse for constraining what we can and can't do on the net on the net, and David's already mentioned ACTA and the TPP, SOPA, PIPA, and CISPA. Let me just mention one thing about SOPA. Um, many of, of the people involved in pushing back on SOPA are also in chest pounding mode uh, and proud of the fact that, that uh, a successful uh, campaign was waged. But I, I would like to suggest to you that part of the reason that the campaign, campaign was successful is that this happens to be an, an election year and the topic of SOPA became toxic from the standpoint of electoral politics. The incumbents who were voting in favor of, of SOPA were pointed out by their opponents as having um, voted in favor or expressed favor uh, for SOPA. So the opponents the, uh, were using this as a political lever to gain uh, electoral support. As soon as something like that becomes toxic, you just run away from it. And that's what happened. I'm, I don't mean to minimize any of the effort that went into raising the alarm, but I would argue that in 2011 or 2013, the leverage would probably be different 
uh, compared to what uh, leverage that particular toxic topic had in 2012. So we should be thoughtful about uh, the effect. Uh, we are also concerned about other forums in which uh, Internet is, uh, is discussed. One, obviously, is the Internet Governance Forum, which will be, I guess, in its sixth year uh, at this point. Uh, it has a couple of interesting properties. It, it arose out of the World Summit on the Information Society. It was the consequence of an endless debate in the working group on Internet governance, which was trying to figure out what's the Internet and how should it be governed and who was in charge. I, I was amused by the first um, questions that came. Remember, the World Summit on the uh, Internet or Information Society was uh, convened as an intergovernmental activity, and the question came up, what's an internet society. And people pointed to internet and said, well, it's something like that. And so the bureaucrats immediately said, who's in charge of the internet? And when we said, well, nobody, they had trouble accepting this because they didn't imagine anything that of that scope could possibly be uh, you know, somehow a, a collaborative uh, activity. Uh, and so they picked on ICANN because it was the most visible uh, thing that might be in charge of the internet. And that debate went on and on until finally the Internet Governance Forum came along. Uh, I have, there are people who criticize the Internet Governance Forum because it doesn't make decisions. And I would like to argue that uh, that forum is actually an important place because it doesn't make decisions. It's a place where it's possible to listen to quite a wide range of issues, hear people uh, pointing out problems in the internet space, and not necessarily try to solve them, and not even necessarily try to convince someone there of your point of view. I found it valuable to be there just to hear what the range of issues are. The problems that are surfaced may actually have solutions in other forums. For example, it's possible that the intellectual property questions might be addressed in WIPO, or some other questions might be addressed in the World Trade Organization. I had a, uh, a bit of time while I was in Geneva recently uh, during the Internet Society's 20th uh, anniversary celebration to meet with the uh, Deputy Secretary General of the World Trade Organization. And I was actually quite impressed to discover that there was some willingness to uh, think very broadly about what kinds of terms and conditions made sense about doing business uh, on the Internet in the context of the WTO. Now, that doesn't mean that the nation states who are members would necessarily adopt anything refreshingly new. Uh, but I think that there are opportunities to take that which surfaces in the IGF and bring it into other forums for further analysis. I also worry about uh, ITU-R. Uh, this is the part that, uh, of the ITU that manages Spectrum, because I understand they've just recently extended their um, Aegis to 300 gigahertz. And I have been hoping that um, there was some very, very high frequency stuff that hadn't been touched by governance and regulations that would allow a place for us to experiment. I continue to be a, a great believer that the radio spectrum is a place where we can invent new ways of sharing uh, the spectrum and of building networks, uh, some of which might uh, fall outside of the normal regulated uh, Aegis, just like in the case of the Wi-Fi, which has turned out to be so incredibly, um, let's say, fruitful, because it doesn't have any uh, specific regulatory uh, registration requirement or allocation requirement, as long as you stay within the radiation level rules that, uh, I guess it's part 15, uh, requires. So uh, I am concerned, again, that this intergovernmental body uh, is extending its uh, reach uh, not only in the spectrum sense, but also in the sense of reaching into Internet, which uh, it heretofore had had, had, had very little uh, to do with. Uh, one argument that could be made is that the ITU, which started out, as you know, as the International Telegraphic or Telegraph Union, and then the International Telephone Union, and then Telecommunications, uh, is in a funny situation because the services that had been primary to its uh, existence uh, are beginning to uh, s sort of submerge in the general Internet. So voice over IP uh, replaces a lot of what had been ordinary telephone calls. Uh, similarly, uh, we're doing so the equivalent of Internet radio, multicasting and broadcasting. Similarly, things like YouTube and other video capability, Netflix, are pushing video out through the Internet as well. So suddenly the purpose-built networks and institutions that ran them that were supporting ITU are starting to dissipate. And the response is to 
figure out well, why is that happening and where else can I uh, get some control in order to continue to support the, uh, the operation. So the head of the ITU, Hamadoun Touré, is very conscious of that and although I think he might argue otherwise before this audience, I think that he has great aspirations for delivering internet to the ITU process. Another thing which is a, a kind of threat to uh, our uh, evolution in the internet is that old business models are still being applied and they don't work very well with the economics of digital. Digital economics is very different than, for example, newspapers have complained that the internet is uh, eroding their business. Well, it's true that printing paper and shipping it to delivery on a regular basis used to be the cheapest way of delivering a large amount of information to a lot of people. And it had the perfect uh, balance because people wanted to read the news and the advertisers wanted eyeballs and the two went together very well. And that business model worked remarkably well for a long time. But now digital distribution is faster. You don't have to worry about the notion of addition. When a story is ready to go, you can release the story. This, this whole uh, environment has a different set of economics. Interestingly enough, Amazon reported, I guess last year, that more than half of all the books that it sells now are delivered in digital form as opposed to paper. I lost $10,000 on that bet because I thought that was going to happen in 2010, but it's okay because the money went to a charity, so I don't feel too bad about it. Uh, but the point here is that the economics of digital are so different from the economics of the physical world uh, that old business models have to be rethought, and some businesses that can't change may just die. Now, I hope that doesn't happen to news. I actually happen to think that journalism is important to democratic societies, but figuring out a business model that will support good quality journalism is still has eluded uh, many of us. Now, there are some responses to these institutional threats. The Internet Society, I think, has done a remarkable job of trying to organize people to react to uh, and to inform them about uh, what's happening uh, in Geneva and New York and elsewhere. The OECD is another forum which his historically had not been a place where uh, many of us engaged, but it has opened up its um, doors, so to speak, to civil society, to the technical community, and to countries that were not originally part of this uh, developed world OECD structure. And so that's a platform uh, that we should take advantage of. Uh, the EU is changing. It has, there are laws that have uh, been enacted uh, that give more power to the parliament than it had before. The European Commission has a different kind of, of uh, authority than it had before. But it is still pushing hard on privacy and data flow and in fact, some of those things, and security, and those things are in conflict with each other. And some of the rules that the, uh, the European Commission proposes to protect privacy uh, interfere with uh, attempts to en engage in security and vice versa. Uh, certainly, um, in the United States, we have NTIA and the State Department that are representing uh, our interests in many of these international forums. But there is tension. Uh, in the United States. Uh, we see that in the form of SOPA, PIPA, CISPA, and some of the other rules that are either associated with intellectual property protection or with the general problem of uh, cybercrime, and I want to come back to that. The ICE, the, uh, the uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, does domain seizures. Uh, some of us are not happy about that. It's not that I disagree that there's, uh, there's abuse. There is abuse. The problem is that the instruments that are available to ICE and that are being used are very blunt. And they, temp they have the, the character of that old joke about the guy who is looking for the, he's, you know, he's sort of hanging over, looking down on the ground beneath a, um, uh, a street light. And the policeman says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm looking for the uh, half dollar I lost. And he said, where did you lose it? And he says, down the street. And he said, well, why are you looking here? And he says, because the light's better here. And the ICE guys have the problem that if they're going to respond to complaints about intellectual property theft or at least abuse, they have to go where they have some authority and jurisdiction. And so they often may end up going after second level domains whose institutions, whose registries and registrars are within their jurisdiction, whereas as you work your way further down in the system, uh, the registrar or the registry uh, may be outside of ICE's jurisdiction and therefore not directly touchable. So the, the tools are very blunt, and I'd like to come back to that and suggest that we have a responsibility on the technical side 
uh, to think about better tools for, uh, for this. Transparency should be our friend, that the institutions that, are, uh, that we see as potentially threatening openness of the network, uh, we uh, should be more transparent, and I think that uh, we should keep insisting on that. Civil society needs to have a voice, and it has been spotty, I think, in places, and we need to do something to amplify that voice wherever we can. Uh, ICANN has the interesting situation now that it's opened up top-level domains that it's sitting on a $350 million uh, income, uh, albeit a, a one-shot. Uh, that's an enormous sum of money. I'm curious to see how they uh, deal with that. There are some technical responses that we can take to some of the threats, things like more resistant operating systems, things that are less able to be uh, invaded. What about more resistant browsers? Much of the infection that takes place today occurs because the browser copies the home file and then interprets it. And in years past, that used to be just text and imagery, but now it's executable code. It's JavaScript, it's Java, it's Python. And those browsers often have more privilege in the operating system that they're running on than they should have. And so the consequence of, in of ingesting malware is to install a virus, a worm, or a Trojan horse. So I'm thinking you know, Google has tried to offer, for example, the open source Android uh, to allow for people to help uh, improve its uh, security. Um, I'm thinking maybe the next version should be called Paranoid instead of Android so that it's even more resistant to some of these uh, invasions. Uh, we can use stronger authentication, for example, two-factor authentication and things like that. Uh, reusable passwords are just awful. People pick bad passwords like password. Some people actually use the word password as their password because it's easy to remember. Of course, everybody else knows that too. Um, so two-factor authentication forces you to have something. could be in your mobile or it could be uh, something that you carry around in addition to re remembering your username and password. Uh, we use this at Google now, two-factor authentication, in order to protect against some forms of invasion. Better use of cryptography for confidentiality would help. HTTPS by default, for example, would be a useful practice. Uh, we are introducing, we, the general internet community, are introducing domain, domain name system security, RPKI, and other mechanisms. Uh, in fact, the recognition that the certificate authority method of validating certificate, certificates is no longer uh, trustworthy because some CAs have been uh, compromised, like the fellow in Iran who was pounding his chest because he generated 600 certificates by compromising a CA. Some of those certificates were for Microsoft and others, which means that your software might have been fooled into ingesting a piece of malware looking like it had come from, uh, from Microsoft, for example. So uh, the CA structure is no longer trustworthy. There are too many CAs, and we don't know which might, might have been compromised. There's a, a working group in the IETF that's looking at something called DANE, which is to allow certificates to go into a DNSSEC protected domain name system. So you insert the certificate in the part of the domain name system where the, where the name that you're trying to bind to a public key would go. The good thing about that idea is that you, you can't generate a certificate that has a name which is outside of the scope of the zone in which the certificate ends up as opposed to a CA, which can authorize or certify any domain name. And so the, the scope for abuse in the CA architecture is much greater than the notion of abuse in the Dane system, so we'll see how that comes out. And I think, uh, to come back now to the point about ICE uh, and others who are trying to uh, react to abuse, um, we could use much better forensics for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is figuring out who done it. Uh, and that means better tools for law enforcement. I don't think that lawlessness is our friend here. I think that we do want to have a structure in which real abuse is dealt with, and that uh, takes me to uh, a, a discussion about real problems that we cannot and should not ignore. In fact, it would be very bad for us as a community to say, well, there aren't any problems in the net, or they are de minimis, and all the good things in the net outweigh all the bad things, and therefore we should do nothing. I don't think that that's a credible position to take. There really are cyber harms. There are crimes that occur on the net. Uh, there is even the possibility of uh, uh, national scale uh, warfare. And we have to be cognizant of that and we have to think about how to respond. Um, I've already mentioned the disruption of old business models. That's a real problem for, for uh, companies that don't know how to react and don't know how to reinvent themselves. 
But I'd also like to suggest to you that some of the bad things that happen on the net we do to ourselves. This is a, this is a place where social norms don't yet exist in cyberspace. I don't think we intuit yet what innocent things we do on the net that actually causes harm. I've been using a simple analogy uh, recently. Imagine that you've gone to Cairo and you want someone to take a picture of you in front of the pyramids. So you can put that up on your Flickr website or Facebook or Google Plus or something. And so you get somebody to take a picture of you. But they, somebody else is in the picture. But you don't care who that is. You, know, you don't know who that is. It just happened to be in the picture. So you put that up on your website. Someone else comes along looking at pictures. Let's assume that your picture is publicly available and, and recognizes this other person and tags the person. Okay, well, that's sort of innocent. But now a third person comes along who knows the party who was tagged or maybe he's looking for that party and looking for tags and then notices that this photograph was taken, you know, on June 15th and the person that they recognize and has been tagged told them they were in London on June 15th. Now suddenly this person who was standing next to you and innocent you know, in all of this is in trouble because you know he or she told somebody that they were someplace else when they were actually in Cairo. So this series of, of actions which look relatively innocent on the surface led to consequences that are harmful to the, this uh, unknown party who was standing next to you or nearby. I don't think that we fully understand yet what sorts of norms make sense in this online environment. It's not going to be easy to figure this out. First of all, we live in a multiplicity of cultures. And, uh, and our, our histories are different, our norms are different. Figuring out how to cope with this global information system that is frankly ignorant of international boundaries and cultural limits and everything else is not going to be easy. I sometimes think this is like raising teenagers. Nobody knows how to do it. You just live through it and one day they turn into people. So. Uh, this may be one of those kinds of situations where we literally have to live through this, see what some of our um, poor intuitions lead to, and then begin to discover what kinds of social norms make sense. We harm ourselves uh, in the intellectual sense by using terms like cybercrime and cyber war, because it leads people to imagine that every bad thing that happens on the net is a crime or that it's evidence of a, of, of a national scale attack. And so I am very concerned that we are careful and thoughtful about when we try to apply terms like that. Uh, I would like to say that cyber safety is what we are interested in on the net. We want people to feel safe, but we are worried that, uh, that there is our unsafe conditions, but they are not always crimes. Sometimes they're just bugs. Sometimes they're innocent mistakes that could be interpreted as a cybercrime attack. The thing I worry most about is misattribution. If you decide that you're under national attack and it's actually been conducted as a false flag exercise, country A is attacking country B, pretending to be country C. And so country B, under attack, decides to respond to country C, not realizing that it's country A. You can imagine all the kinds of uh, collateral damage that could cause, whether it's a cyber response or worse, it might be conventional or let's hope not a military uh, nuclear response. Even if it's a cyber type response, if it's a botnet attack, the botnet elements are usually innocent people's machines that have been compromised. So if you decide you're going to fire off a responding botnet to infect and destroy everybody's disk drives that you can find in the botnet, you'll be harming a bunch of innocent people who didn't know their machines had been compromised and didn't intend to attack you at all. We're going to need a multi-stakeholder dialogue in order to resolve some of these issues, to try to respond to them. This is not going to be something that governments alone can figure out. And that's why it's so important to continue a dialogue with the civil society, with the technical community, with the private sector, as well as governments, in order to figure out how to go forward and how to protect against these various serious problems. So we speak about freedom. We talk about freedom to speak the freedom to hear, the freedom to gather, to assemble information, to access that information, the freedom to choose. But I think we should also incorporate into our thinking freedom from harm. How are we going to go about achieving that? Well, there isn't any one way to do it. There are some technical responses that we can take. 
there are responses to the form, detect that something bad has happened, and argue, if we figure out who did it, there will be consequences. We do that with drinking and driving, for example. We know we can't stop people from doing it, but we tell them, this is socially unacceptable, there are laws, if we catch you doing this, we'll take your license away, or we'll fine you, or put you in jail. So that's sort of detect and respond. And then finally, there's moral suasion. Just tell people don't do that. It's just not, you know, it's not nice. It's socially unacceptable, so please don't do those things. None of those individually will solve the problem. The three together may actually mitigate much of the problem that we see. But we have to adopt those practices, and we have to agree to do that uh, in order to achieve our uh, desired ends. So those are my, let me call them formal remarks for this morning. I note I have a few more minutes left. I'm happy to engage in discussion if the chairman so chooses, uh, or I can run away off the stage. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman. For, uh, um, one or two well-chosen questions to follow that remarkably eloquent speech. Question, uh, Daniel Berninger. Um, Vint, so there's a lot of moving pieces. Do you have any sense of the whether the force of disconnectivity versus the force of connectivity is more unified? So I think you know the outcome is whoever's unified wins, uh, so to speak. Do you have a sense who is more unified? Well, I'm not sure. That that's an interesting framing of the question. Um, I have to say that uh, the elements that are most threatening are the intergovernmental bodies that have authorities, they have treaty status, they have the potential ability to uh, cause laws to be enacted uh, and enforced. And it's very hard for uh, the parts of our system that don't have that level of authority to, to respond. We have to be fairly noisy about it. Uh, so I think that the, the, the threatening parties in this case are probably better positioned than we are. On the other hand, I'm an engineer, and uh, I'm, it's like John Gilmore, you know, his comment about the uh, internet detects censorship and treats it as damage and routes around it. I have this, let me say, optimistic belief that if somebody's going to prevent me from communicating, I'm going to find a way around it. And as an example, when the Egyptians turned off all the underlying transmission systems, which effectively shut down the internet, if that had gone on for very much longer, I guarantee you, we would have seen Wi-Fi and WiMAX, cross-border things, balloons, and all kinds of other mechanisms to try to overcome that uh, uh, suppression of communication. And so that's the place where I think we have an opportunity to do something. I think of the, the, the uh, governmental bodies as a big boulder rolling down a hill. And we're too small to stop the boulder. But we're not too small to figure out where to put a pebble to cause the boulder to get deflected. And I think that's the place where the engineers and civil society can be very creative, finding the pebble and putting it in the right place. Next question. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. You want to lower the, the uh, microphone where so I can hear you? All right, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Andrew Feinberg. I'm with the Hill newspaper here in D.C. Uh, you're talking about intergovernmental bodies and the danger posed by them, and you spoke earlier about the danger posed by uh, laws like SOPA and PIPA that are now defunct in the legislative process, but what about some of the current cybersecurity bills going through, like CISPA? Do you see them as, CISPA specifically, as son of SOPA, or do you see any value in it, or is it all danger? So, I, you know, in some ways, all of these have some small element of good intent in them, but what is it, the, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? Um, I worried, I looked at the CISPA uh, as it went through some of its manager, management uh, restructuring uh, and editing. The thing that worried me the most and continues to worry me is that the sharing of information feel, felt very unconstrained. Uh, even though language said this was supposed to be used for security purposes only, once information lands in the hands of somebody, uh, it can possibly end up in somebody else's hands and cause an awful lot of damage. So uh, I didn't think that there were adequate... Um, uh, constraints built in to that legislation to prevent harms from occurring to people whose information was conveyed in either direction, either into government hands or from the government into the private sector. The private sector is not uh, completely uh, blameless and innocent here. 
uh, the private sector has it within its power to uh, gather a considerable amount of information about its users. And it's, whether it decides to protect that information sufficiently is in some ways a business decision. And it's important, I think, certainly where I come from at Google, uh, it's considered very important to treat that information uh, with great respect and to not share it inappropriately. But we have problems in both dimensions, both with the legal uh, descriptions in things like CISPA and business practices that might be uh, associated with it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you all for bearing with me this morning. I will be here until 1.30, and then I have to run away, but I'm looking forward to uh, further dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Um, a couple of housekeeping.